heard about customer dis- about customer okay we're good recording uh i don't know how much you guys have heard about customer discovery um but this is basically the process of going out to your market validating whether or not you've, you've got a problem and a solution that's actually going to fit um with their needs right so so ultimately i work with a lot of companies that are they're engineer focused companies you know the founders are engineers maybe scientists lots of doctors that sort of thing sometimes they come to me and they go hey riley i've got this really cool thing uh i want to i want to sell i want to commercialize it and i go okay but have you validated that that problem actually existed have you did you did you did you write down that problem and did you go out and talk to anybody and a lot of people will actually come back to me and say you know what we actually didn't do that we just think this is a cool idea and i go well there's a problem here right um if you you can you can actually end up uh, in a really bad place we call having a solution searching for a problem and if that's the case We've got a lot of work to do. So we, we try to, at The Forge, we try to um, prime our companies to avoid this problem when you, uh, when you get into our, our incubator, when you get into our programming, we were hoping to, uh, you know, avoid this problem. And, and that's why, you know, I'm here and kind of pontificating on the, uh, you know, customer discovery. So um, here's what we're hoping to get through today. Uh, you know, this workshop normally is a smaller group and normally I ask people to share, uh, you know, uh, their problem statement and uh, we workshop their, you know, the customer discovery that they can go through a little bit. Um, today, we're probably not going to, just because we've got such a big uh, crew uh, on the call, we're probably not going to do too much of that. Um, however, I will be asking for like maybe one or two people so I can use uh, those, those problems as a case study. So um, with regards to the agenda, uh, just kind of go through an overview. I've got a, a, a video to show you on that. Uh, we're going to talk about what a problem statement is. Uh, pretty straightforward stuff. I'm going to have um, maybe one or two people involved in, in sharing theirs. Uh, then we're going to talk about journey mapping and kind of how do we stay wide when we're looking at the problem and then how do we focus uh, down. Um, uh, we're going to talk about the problem interview. Um, so, so that's kind of like the first step into doing a customer discovery. Uh, and then we're going to talk about some, some key things like avoiding bias. Uh, it's very important to approach your customer discovery from an unbiased standpoint. A lot of people, if they do it wrong, they might end up in a place where they've got uh, confirmation bias. And if you've got confirmation bias, you're back to a really bad situation where you may have a solution looking for a problem. Um, and then we're going to do a uh, problem interview uh, uh, quick kind of workshopping. We'll see if we have time for that. Um, then we're going to start talking a little bit about the solution, right? So we, we cover problem. We talk about solution. Customer discovery, guys, it's like a continuum. It doesn't, it doesn't quit, right? Uh, you know, you're, you're doing it up front when you think you're, you, you know, a problem that you want to solve. Then you're, we're going to do it as we get to uh, the solution, right? And then even past that, right? I always tell my companies, you know, if you're doing, if, if you're, if you're a, a salesperson, what should you be doing? Well, you should be selling, 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 selling all the time, right? What does a product developer always need to be doing? The answer to that is researching, researching, researching. This does not stop, okay? Customer discovery, going out, UX research, all of that stuff, you know, you know, going back to your target market, that does not end right after you've built something, Okay. It continues. So, um, you know, th this kind of toolkit that I'm giving you here is going to be useful at the beginning, at the middle, when you're a scalable company, when you're a, 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 um, when you're a public company, you know, all the way through. So, yeah. So we're going to talk about solution interviewing. What is that? Um, how do you do it? We're going to talk a little bit about prototyping tools and methods. Uh, and I know I, I think you might have talked a little bit about some of these things in in a, another workshop, but uh, if, if so, I'm, I'm going to rehash a little bit, maybe give you a different flavor. Um, and then we're going to, um, we're not really going to be doing any sharing at the end, but uh, we'll end with some questions. So uh, let's go to our next slide here.
Um, so, so if you, if you don't mind, would you just, uh, you know, write down your problem statement? I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you a template to do that, uh, in a couple of slides, but just to kind of get you ready to write that down just so that we can, uh, at least get one or two people's inputs. All right. So let me just define uh, customer development or customer discovery for you. Uh, it, it's a formal methodology for building startups and new corporate ventures. It is one of the three parts that make up the lean, uh, a lean startup. Okay, so the, the other component, the, the, all the components are business model design, customer development, agile engineering. Okay, so this is one major customer development, customer discovery, synonymous things. Um, those make up the three components uh, of the lean startup. Uh, it could be used during all the, pro I kind of have already talked about this, right? All the way through the continuum of, of, of developing a, a startup, you've got uh, the customer development, customer discovery process. Um, and also kind of one of the important things here, it, it helps identify new market opportunity uh, and, and, and enables you to have better differentiation of your business, right? And I'll talk a little bit about um, uh, Blue Ocean strategy a little bit further into this uh, presentation, but the key is, uh, one of the keys to being successful is differentiation, okay? How are we different from the competitor? What makes, us, what makes people want to pay us versus our competitor for our product? Okay, so this is a little video I have, and it's uh, by the uh, godfather of uh, customer development, who is Steve Blank. He is a uh, professor at uh, Stanford University. I'm just going to go ahead and pull that up, that video up. I've got it on YouTube here. All right, here we go. Hopefully, I shared my audio. Hold on. Let's double check that. All righty. Let's take a look at the first step in customer discovery. You're going to be living this for the next couple of weeks if you're doing this for real. Phase one is you state your hypotheses and you draw the business model canvas. And again, you put the canvas on the wall, you and your team get around and uh, put up yellow stickies. But the next step is you get out of the building. You're going to test the problem. You're going to test your understanding of the customer's problem or need, and you're going to figure out how to build the prototype. The next thing is you're going to test the solution. And you're going to test the solution if you're on the web by building a uh, low fidelity and then a high fidelity prototype. And you're going to again test your understanding of the customer's needs and whether your solution matches it. And this match, again, is called product market fit. That's the holy grail for entrepreneurs. Am I building something that people can't get enough of or are just willing to open up their wallets and empty it in front of you to get their hands on? And the fourth phase in customer discovery is you verify or pivot. Do people agree that you're solving a high value problem or need? And do you understand your business model enough to start test selling, which is the next step in customer validation? Now, what's really depressing to most entrepreneurs is the answer most often the first time you go through this is heck no. You know, it's, and, and what's worse is, well, they kind of sort of like, well, kind of sort of is not a startup kind of sort of as people have been nice to you. The only time you know that you have something that's worth investing your time and money in is if people are literally trying to force their money on you or can't use your product even in its buggy, uninitialized form enough. This is what you're looking for. And if you haven't found it yet, that's why the customer development process is an iterative circle. It assumes you will be going through this multiple times. And when you finally, finally think you do have something that matches customer needs, you get to the next step, which is customer validation. Fantastic. Thank you, Steve. Ugh. One sec. Uh, let's push this one. There we go. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, it's interesting that. Um, so ultimately ends up in a cycle, cyclical. Uh, what I thought I'd talk to you about. Uh... Got videos playing here. Ugh, I hate that autoplay thing on YouTube. All right, back to this. 
yeah, so sorry about that. Um, what I was saying was, is, uh, ultimately, this ends up in a cycle, right? Uh, and I don't know if anybody can kind of identify where the cycle comes from, but this is the scientific method, right? If you're a scientist, if you're an engineer, if you're a biologist, if you're anything that's ever worked in science, uh, this is the scientific method for business, right? We hypothesize about our, our, what the problem is. We, um, you know, we come up with some assumptions. We go out, we create a, a, a test for it. We test the problem, right? We ideate on what uh, we think would be a solution. We test the solution. We validate or, or ver sorry, verify or or we pivot after we, we, we run our tests. We analyze our results, determine if we're on the right track. And um, we either come up with a new hypothesis or we, we move on, right? And so it's a series of tests. This is essentially the process we're going through here. So, uh, you know, fa a quick fact way to hear, most companies have not investigated the company thoroughly enough. In fact, uh, I have another slide that I like to sh show sometimes. The reason that most startups fail is not because they don't have enough money. Uh, it's not because they don't have the right team. It's, it's not because they can't find investment. Number one, it's because they haven't um, matched a problem with a solution. They haven't really figured out that product market fit, what Steve was talking about in the last video I told you. Um, ultimately, just because you know technology is nice, fairly malleable, you can you can use it to create solutions for things, doesn't mean you should, right? So I, I get a lot of people coming to me who say, you know, I could do this really cool thing. My um, education, my experience allows me to use technology to create really cool things. But ultimately, it doesn't mean that you, the technology is going to be the answer, right? Um, you can use, you could build uh, something really simple without the use of technology that will solve a problem appropriately uh, enough that someone will be happy with that solution, right? And if you can do that, and it's simple and it's easy to make and people will pay you money for it. The margin, the, the return, um, you know, after you've paid your kind of your expenses can ultimately be higher going that way, right? So, so don't get set on using a medium like technology uh, to solve a problem. Um, another point here, once you dig into the problem, there might be a bigger problem to solve. Uh, or maybe you'll understand it differently, right? So, so you think you might understand a problem, but do you really understand that problem? Um, once you, the only way to know is to talk to people, right? So that's why we encourage as much in person. I know that's tough right now. COVID causes that kind of uh, issue, and I'll, uh, we could talk a little bit more about strategy to actually get to your target market a little bit later, but. Um, you want to be face to face as much as possible in person. If you can't right now, I know you can't video calls. Okay. Or even just phone calls, but don't survey people. Okay. Surveying is the, is the, it's, 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 it's kind of a, almost a cop out, right? Uh, you know, you don't get to actually know the person you're talking to. Um, I actually, I had a call earlier today with a company of mine. They, they're like, oh, we surveyed like a thousand people and here's what we heard. And I'm like, okay, but like, what are the, what are the, how, how would you describe those customers? What are their likes? What are their hobbies? What are their needs? What are their desires? What are the challenges that they're having? And they couldn't tell me any of that, right? So, and then they complained to me later about the fact that they're spending so much money on marketing. And I said, okay, so you're spending a ton of money on marketing and you don't know the customer. No wonder you're spending so much money on marketing because you don't know how to target those people. At the end of the day, customer discovery is great for understanding problems, whether solutions work, validating, but it's also really important to companies who are trying to sell products as cheaply as possible, saving on their marketing budgets, right? If you understand someone, where they go on the internet, where they shop in person, um, what they're um, what they're looking for, uh, where, what sorts of websites they visit, it's going to make it really easy for you to target them, right? So there's kind of an additional benefit to uh, 
making sure you're in front of your end user as much as possible. All right, um, I'm gonna quickly, I'm gonna put this up here. Um, normally I'd have everybody kind of fill out a problem statement. Uh, and I am going to um, ask a few people to share um, just so that we have something to work off of. But this is the template that I use for creating a problem statement. Now, I don't know if you guys have already heard about this or if you've already created problem statements, um, but this is the first step. Um, you know, this is like the hypothesis. What is it that we are trying to, to fix, right? Uh, what is the, pro the core of the problem? So I use the Lyft example uh, quite a bit, right? When Lyft uh, started, they didn't say, okay, we're, we're gonna, we're gonna, we think taxis are garbage. So we're gonna, we're gonna be creating a taxi company. That's not how they started, right? So the way they started is they, they found that there was, was an, a problem with carpooling on college campuses, right? Carpooling, um, common, uh, used to be common, I don't know if it still is. This is like an old problem. But carpooling used to be a, a thing that people did back in the day instead of taking public transit, especially if they live far away from campus, uh, that sort of thing, right? So, so what's the problem with carpooling? Well, the problem was safety and communication and, uh, and knowing who you're, you're, you're driving with. So really came back to safety and and uh, the fact that it's kind of weird getting into a car with a stranger, right? And how, how comfortable do you feel? So what they did was they identified that as a problem. They prototyped a solution for it. So uh, they said, okay, so a lot of people are feeling unsafe. So, uh, you know, and the, the current way of, of carpooling is we slap a, a poster up on a bulletin board and we put a number there and you can rip your name off. Uh, or sorry, the number off and call the person if you're traveling on this route uh, and you're wanting to carpool. And, and so instead of that, they, uh, they built a Facebook group and they allowed people to rank each other based on the carpool rides that they took. And ultimately, um, there was a lot of uptake. There was a lot of value being seen in, in this model. So they created an app and then they expanded to other universities, right? So they started with a really niche problem, a really niche kind of area at one university, college students, right? And then they, they expanded out. So they really had a, focused in on a kind of a really niche specific problem before they kind of expanded and started to solve this kind of more systemic, larger societal problem of taxis not being safe, not being reliable, being expensive. And so that's what I encourage you guys to do when you're thinking about the problem. All right. And so the kind of the format is problem you're solving. So what is the problem? Who are you solving it for? And the impact it will have, right? If you, if you can solve that problem. I don't want to know what your solution is. I just want to know what the problem is. Um, Hamza, you're uh, the first guy right on my screen. I know you don't have your video on. Um, but if you wouldn't mind uh, flicking your video on and sharing your problem with me, that would be great. Uh, hi, yeah. Hey, brother. Yeah. Hopefully I didn't catch you off guard. Uh, <laughs> well, let's, let, let's give it a shot here. Uh, what is the problem that your group is solving? Um, so the problem my group is solving is poor communication between family doctors and families. Um, so a lot of a lot of um, my group members have the issue where their family doctors don't send them test results or when they go to a walk-in clinics, either their insurance isn't accepted there or it's full and they need to wait for a long time. So one of the ideas we came up with was creating a platform to make communication between doctors and clinics and patients easier. Let me pause you there, okay? So, so you told me right when I asked you, and I know I'm putting you on the spot and thank you very much for participating. You're, you said the problem is that family doctors don't talk to each other. Right. Is that the core of the problem? And who is having this problem? Like who, who is the ultimate end user of the problem that you're trying to solve? Is it the doctors or is it the patients? It's the patient. It's the okay. So what's the problem the patient is having? 
not receiving proper information and follow-ups from the doctor. Right. But what is the pain point that the end user, the patient has? They don't have information, but why, like, what, 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 why do they need that information? Um, I guess it makes them feel more at ease when they have it. Okay. And it, yeah, continue. Go ahead. Sorry. And it'll make, it makes them feel more at ease and it like, um, people like it. Um, it makes people feel more comfortable when they know that their doctor is following up on their case, I think, I guess. Okay. So, so I guess the problem you're solving is the, um, uh, lack of communication between patient and practitioner or the um, feeling like uh, a, a person is in the dark about their medical uh, exactly. treatment, right? Exactly. Perhaps that what it, that's what it is, right? Okay, so that would be the problem. Who you're solving it for? Is, there, is it a specific age group range? Is it a specific ailment that you're trying to solve? Uh, uh, like a patient with a specific ailment or like who are you solving this problem for? Is it all patients? I, I would encourage you to, to try to stay niche with this group of people. So who would that be? We haven't really thought about the exact target audience. We just thought that um, like your average family. Okay. Um, so yeah, you might want to refine that a little bit more because to solve a problem for so many people, like everyone who seeks medical treatment, whether they be pregnant women, whether they be elderly people, whether they be young people, right? That, that could be kind of tough, right? So if you can focus in on a specific target group, I, I can tell you that's gonna make it easier to, to kind of come up with a solution, right? So, so then you would just kind of insert that problem we're solving, lack of, or feeling like lack of transparency for medical treatment, solving it for you know um, males 25 to 35, uh, the impact it will have, right? And, and, and what would be the impact? Um, yeah, we'll definitely, definitely keep that in mind to narrow down our target audience. Yeah. So, so, but what would be the impact of, of, of this, uh, of trying to fix this problem, right? People feel more secure moving forward exactly. in their lives, right? Um, could, like, it could also push people to feel more comfortable asking the doctor more questions because they know that the doctor is more willing to actually answer those questions. Fantastic. So now you have a problem statement, right? Um, of course, I haven't written it all down here. You probably have it better in your head than I do. But now you have, this is almost like a hypothesis, right? This is what you believe. Now you have to, there's some assumptions surrounding it, right? What would an assumption be? That people, you know, I mean, the, the easiest one here is that, uh, t you know, people 25 to 35 feel in the dark about their medical treatment, or they come away from the physician's office feeling, um, insecure, right? Those would be some of the assumptions you have. And so how do we test that? We go out, we, we create a few questions and we ask these end users, hey, just tell me about the last time you went to the doctor. How did you feel about the follow-up? How did you feel? Um, what were some of the challenges you had um, uh, in communicating with the physician, right? These, these are all questions you can ask. Ultimately, the answers you're looking for are there to, to kind of uh, qualify those assumptions, right? So, so did, uh, were you able to validate or invalidate any of those assumptions that you had? That's essentially what we're trying to do. So the problem statement though, that's our hypothesis, right? Um, and I think the chat has been uh, on here. Nope, okay, good. Uh, okay, great. Um, so I, you know, I, could, I could workshop these things all day with you guys, but Ultimately, you want to think about your end user, who's having the core problem, try to be specific, right? Uh, as specific as possible, and don't inject your solution into that problem statement, right? Great. Does anybody have any questions? Thanks, Hamza. No problem. Okay. Doesn't sound like we have any, any questions. Uh, feel free to interrupt me if you do, guys. Um, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, uh, if you have like a, a broad group of people that you not you, like um, that you're, you know, thinking of helping, how do you go on about like narrowing down that group to a specific um, end user or client? Okay, uh, why don't you work? Why don't we workshop your? Um, Going to put you on the spot. 
Uh, Sristi, is that how you say your name? Yes. Uh, Sristi. Why don't you give us your problem statement as it is now, and uh, I, we can try to work through it together. Um, so, so far, we haven't really created like a problem. We've kind of found the space that we want to like okay. that we're targeting. So, so far, we know that we want to, you know, help people with uh, suffering from mental issues and addictions, but we don't really know the problem we're solving uh, at the moment. Yeah. Okay, great. So what you're going to do is, is something I'm going to explain in a moment here. It's called journey mapping. Okay. It allows you to stay wide. So hold on to that thought uh and we'll, we'll we'll workshop it when i talk about um uh journey mapping which is like literally coming right up okay so just hold on to that for a second um so the problem statement allows you to stay wide uh you know it helps you see things you might have missed right so you could keep ref referring back to your problem statement as you go out and do research um it, it provides you some contextualization for the problem uh and and it you know, make sure to uh, that you're analyzing kind of all the stakeholders in the value chain, right? So, uh, for Hamza, his his problem, there's other players in that value chain, right? Value chain is what are all the who are all the people that are involved in making, uh, you know, solving that problem? And so, you know, he's obviously got the ultimate end user, is the patient. There's also the doctor. Perhaps the medical system plays a role. Perhaps there's other healthcare providers involved. Perhaps there's lab technicians. It could be a number of different um, people involved in that value chain. And, and so uh, that problem statement allows you to kind of go back and make sure that you know, um, you're understanding who's in that value chain and that you're talking to those other elements, right? It's really important that you, you know uh, kind of everybody's take on this problem in the value chain in order to solve the problem for one ultimate end user. Um, okay, so uh, Sristi asked about what do we do if we have, you know, we know we want to solve this big wide problem, but we don't know how to focus in. Okay, because uh, because ultimately Sristi is Sristi can't she, her team like you you have limited amount of time, especially I mean for this for this program, but even as a business, right, like. Uh, if you're a startup company, you're very limited on time and resources, so you can't boil the ocean, okay? I come back to that so much, don't boil the ocean. Start small and niche, expand. Um, we also call it a beachhead market, right? So uh, think about World War II, right? The Allied forces, they landed on Normandy Beach, right? And then they spread out across Europe. That's the same concept for a business, right? You pick your little niche, and then you slowly expand, you know, Google, they started with, um, you know, uh, search, right? Search engine optimized, uh, search engines, uh, helping people find stuff on the internet. And now they're, they're mad, they're basically everything, right? But they, you know, how long did it take them to become everything? Took them a long time. Okay, so the key is find the most potent problem, right? So you've got, I use my kind of my diagram here. You've got a funnel at the top. You've got all these problems, right? This is where Sristi is with her group. You've got so many problems for, for people who are addicted to drugs or have mental, uh, you know, problems. There's tons of, pro like, there's tons of little minuscule problems here that all contribute. Um, so what you want to boil that down to is the most potent problem, okay? And that's kind of um, what I've got here. And here's a tool for doing that, okay? So in Sristi's case, um, the people that she wants to help, uh, no, Sristi, can you help me out here? You wanna help people who have drug addictions or you wanna help people who have like mental dis uh, like problems or, or, or suffering from psychological problems? What, what you gotta kind of pick one. Mm -hmm. So I think our, um, our team was focusing more on health, mental health problems because mental the suicide health. rates have like gone up. That okay. inspired us. Yeah. So, so an example of something you can do uh, is, is kind of just, is, it's called journey mapping, but really what it is, it's cataloging a day in the life. Okay. So you would go and talk to someone who's got, you know, some sort of mental problem and you just ask them about their day. 
catalog, tell me, walk me through your day piece by piece. Like, what did you do when you woke up in the morning? How did it make you feel, right? Kind of sounds like you're sitting on the couch a little bit, right? <laughs> in, the, in, the, in the psychologist's office, but really that's essentially what you're doing. You're trying to catalog their day. And as you talk to them about specific moments, like uh, I can't remember what this example is here, but they've broken it down in, in stages, right? So you've got stages of the journey. This is to buy a product of some sort, right? And then and kind of lower on the left-hand side here, we've got, we've got our feelings, right? Uh, and, and activities also, right? So stages of the journey, uh, you know, um, I can't read it, it's too small, but ultimately, you can classify things by stage and then you, the, you break it down by individual activity, right? So I woke up in the morning, right? That's the, usually going to be the first, you know, activity. Um, and then you can ask, how did you feel? So if the person woke up in the morning and didn't feel great, you can dig deeper. Hey, look, why didn't you feel great when you woke up in the morning, right? There might be, um, you know, there, there's going to be a lot more minutia to that. I want you to always dig in, right? When you hear something, you know, I don't know about you guys, maybe it's just me, but when I wake up in the morning, I'm usually feeling like decently refreshed. Sure, maybe a little tired still, but like, hey, let's attack the day. Maybe somebody who's suffering from uh, the, the issues that Tristy and her group are trying to solve, don't wake up feeling great. And, 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 and that might be something you wanna look at, right? So now you ask more questions. What may, what, you know, why are you feeling this way when you wake up in the morning? Tell us a little bit more about this. How long has this been happening to you for, right? Catalog that. So you can see this through line that's, that's kind of going on here, right? Um, this is, this line, although this is a very simple concept, allows you to see throughout the journey how people are feeling. So uh, throughout their day, right? If you're seeing, seeing a lot of like these unhappy faces or these like negative moments, you know that there's got to be something in that part of the journey, their daily journey, that is worth solving, right? And if you talk to five or six people or 10 people experiencing the same issues, right, and you find that after you go through this, this workshop um, or this journey mapping exercise with them, that there's a big hole in one part of their day where you've got a bunch of unhappy faces people are feeling down at that point in time, maybe that's something that you should be looking at as a problem to solve, right? Um, that's just one way of kind of narrowing this down, right? Of course, journey mapping can be used for a lot of things, right? So, so I kind of started really wide with, tell me about your day, you know, what's your kind of day in the life? But then I could talk to, you know, Areeb and say, Areeb, you know, maybe I'm working at Maybe I'm working for Amazon, right? And, I, and I'm, I'm curious about his experience buying a product. I could say, hey, Areeb, take me through the, state, the, the activities that you performed on the way to buying X product, right? And okay, well, you know, so just start with tell me how you discovered it, right? And, and so Areeb will tell me about that and he'll tell me how he felt and, and we'll, we'll map out that whole process, right? So you can use journey mapping as a really wide tool but also a really kind of more focused tool, right? Um, to focus in on a problem. It's a very, 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 this is a tool that's used in UX research pretty much all the time, pretty much from wherever, right? Um, doesn't matter what company you're working for, this is part of it. Okay, so uh, Sristi, does that help you kind of uh, answer the question on how to kind of maybe focus in on a problem? Yes, definitely, thank you. Yeah, so always guys, I just, I'm gonna say it one more time. If you're not hearing what someone, if you're not understanding what someone's telling you, if it doesn't make sense, if you're expecting to hear someone something else um, or the way that they were explaining it to you was emphatic, right? Like, oh God, that just sucked so bad, you know, this part of my day, or it was just so, so unfortunate, right? comes back to this, right? The potency of the problem. If somebody is really focused in on something and they're, and they're emphatic when they're explaining it to you. There's got to be a reason. Ultimately, guys, we buy things <laughs> because they, they, they're, they're the most potent problem we're having, right? I'm not going to buy, you know, if I have a dirty computer screen, 
And, but it's not really bugging me that much. I'm probably not gonna go shopping for one of these on Amazon, right? If, the mo if, if that day my phone is broken, I use this phone constantly and it's not working, that's gonna be my most potent problem of the day. And I'm going to, the first thing I'm going to buy is this phone. I'm gonna hope to get one of these thrown in because I just spent $1,500 on a phone. But if not, maybe another day I'll buy this. But for today, that's not my most potent problem. And when we buy things, to take money out of someone's pocket, it's really actually fairly hard to get people to pull money out of their pocket and give it to you. It's so important that you know the most potent problem that they're having or else there's no way for you to be able to sell to them, right? Your value proposition has to be very finely tuned in on what that problem is. So we got journey mapping, okay? That's a really awesome tool. There's tons more information out there, guys. I only have a little bit of time to talk about journey. I could probably do a whole workshop on journey mapping. I really encourage you to look in. If you want to be a product manager, this is something very important that you should look into. Okay. So we talked a little bit about assumptions before, right? And um, so surrounding your problem, you're going to have some assumptions that you're going to want to test. Um, surrounding your solution, you're going to have problems that you want to test or some assumptions you want to test. There's, uh, there's a tool called the business model canvas that actually allows you the opportunity to identify the assumptions you have in not just the, 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 the users and their problems and, and your, your value proposition, but all about the, the business model, right? So whether it comes to partners, whether it comes to cost structure, whether it comes to, it, it helps you kind of collate and keep track of the assumptions that you have about each one of these things and gives you kind of that, that um, basis to come back and, and, and catalog what kind of information we're getting about these assumptions. Are they, are they correct? Do they need to be modified? And so um, I'm going to introduce you to this video. Um, it's, it's by, uh, so it's a guy pitching basically his company called Ruby on a stage uh, at an event. And Ruby is this fetal um, heart monitoring uh, device. And he uses the business model canvas to contextualize what he's talking about. And um, I know, I don't know, I don't think everybody in this thing's ever heard of the business model canvas, but what, you know, I could also do another whole workshop on that. And I'm just going to play you the first little bit that talks about customer segments and value proposition, because that's really what I want you to focus on. Okay. I'm not going to confuse you with the whole business model canvas, but those are, that, that's kind of the context in which I'm going to show you this video. Okay. So give me a sec here. Stop sharing. I'm going to reshare. Okay. And so the video is uh, 15 minutes in total. I'm only going to play about three or four minutes. Um, but if you do want to watch the rest of the, the video at a later date, um, you're gonna, I'm gonna share these slides and you'll be able to watch. But he actually goes through and talks about how did I validate the entire um, business model canvas? What were my assumptions? And it, it's actually a very useful tool. Like if you're actually, if you're looking to take this idea and make it into a business, you're gonna go through this exercise. Um, but like I said, for now, I'm just gonna show you the first part. Please uh, join me in welcoming to the stage, Ruby from Brigham Young University. Hey everyone, thanks for being here. My name is Eric, and this is Ruby, the world's first wearable fetal activity tracker. And I want to take you on the journey that my team and I have taken over the last six months to help bring pregnant women all over the world peace of mind. Now, ultimately, it started in my own home. My wife had an awful pregnancy, replete with surprise doctor visits and all kinds of late night calls to the nurse. And they told her in order to relieve your anxiety, you gotta lay down on your side and count your kicks for th 30 minutes to an hour and do that several times a day. I'd watch her do this, and I knew that there had to be a better way. To put this in perspective, sudden infant death syndrome, or SIDS, afflicts one out of every 2,000 children in the United States, and parents spend hundreds of dollars to prevent that each year, while stillbirth is more than 10 times that rate at one out of 160 pregnancies being afflicted. And so that led me to my first assumption, that anxious 
uh, mothers want peace of mind. And the way that they're going to find that is through an at-home ultrasound system. And so I went out to the canvas, and I set up my assumptions, and I went out to test. And I quickly found that anxiety in pregnant women is extremely high, while confidence in their ability to track is far too low. And when I presented the idea for the at-home ultrasound system to them, they hated it. It was the worst thing ever. Not only are they inundated with all kinds of negative buzz, but even their doctors tell them, please do not have more than two ultrasounds during your pregnancy. It can be dangerous for the baby. Luckily, all these surveys and interviews did help me figure out exactly what the pain points were that my customers were, were looking to solve. And in order, they're looking for peace of mind that their baby is developing and moving OK. Number two was convenience. They don't want to have to be counting their kicks all day. And third is they'd love to reduce that stillbirth rate around the world. So we nailed our customer segments, but our value proposition still needed some work. And that's when I met Dr. Anton Bowden, and I made my first major pivot. Now, he's been working in the last decade for this special type of nanomaterial that's capable of tracking kick count, heart rate, and fetal position. So instead of using this ultrasound type model, we would transition to a more wearable model. So the product is like a fetal Fitbit, which uses that patented nanotechnology in a maternity band-like design to keep track of all the relevant aspects of fetal movement. And all that information is sent via Bluetooth to mom's app so that she can know just how active her baby is all the time. But this was completely unvalidated, so we had to set up, set up a new assumption on the canvas and go out to test. 231 surveys and 36 interviews later, we found consistent results for anxiety and lack of confidence. And when we introduced the new idea for them, they loved it. Not only were they positive about it, but on all the pain points, they indicated that our product knocked it out of the park. And our data suggests that we're able to predict and prevent stillbirth at an extremely high rate. And so we nailed down our customer segments even more, and we validated our unique value proposition. This took us zero dollars in about three weeks. The next thing that we had to do was, of course, right. figure out. So that's, that's basically the beginning of developing a product, guys. Let me just go ahead and share my screen again. Hold on. Oh, I hate not having two screens. OK. There we go. So, uh, yeah, I've kind of talked about this already, but in order to take your business to the next step, you need to validate your assumptions. They had a number of assumptions all along the way. And it's a good thing they tested, especially the first assumption about the product solution, which is uh, fetal, uh, you know, at home ultrasound, which is a disaster. Um, could have been really problematic if they had gone through all the R&D to develop that just to find out that it's not even really usable. Um, right, so, so yeah, this is the business model canvas, guys. I do a whole workshop on the business model canvas, but essentially the two mo most important boxes here, right? Value proposition, it's right in the middle and that's for good reason, because um, it's the most important thing. This is what, what you're providing that, that adds value that people want to pay for, right? And the customer segments, this is, these are the, the people who are having the problem, that, the potent problem that needs to be solved through your value proposition. Steve Blank, remember I showed you that video at the beginning? The relationship between these two boxes is what we call product market fit, which is exactly what you're going after, right? When you get to product market fit, now you've, you've really, you've done the hard part, now you just need to figure out how to scale your idea, right? But that's, that's kind of the relationship that we're after. And you, you don't have to worry about all this stuff right now, guys, all this other stuff. Um, that's for later. That's when you really start working with the forge. We, we can talk about this other stuff. But for now, it's just these two boxes. All right. Who has a, does anybody have any questions? Take a look at the chat here. Supriya had to run. Okay. We've answered Swisty's question. So, okay. It looks like we're good. All right. So when it comes to the problem interview, right? This is the, the first foray into asking people questions about your problem. Okay. So you've got your problem statement, you've got some assumptions, you've created some, some questions. I, I like to call this the interview guide, okay? 
Because you're not going to just sit there and fire off questions to a read like, hey, you know, answer this question, answer this question. It's about turning it into a conversation because ultimately this person who's on the other end, you're going to ask them about their problem and you're going to want them to have another conversation with you. You're going to come back to these people and you're going to say, hey, listen, I talked to you about the problem. I've got a solution now. Do you want to, you know, I'm going to tell you about it if, if you want. Uh, and I'd love to get your feedback on that. Ultimately, you're developing relationships. At the end of the day, um, after you build something, let's say you take this thing all the way through, you build it, you, you, you might even be able to convert that person into an early adopter, a product evangelist, as we call, call these people. These are people that are comfortable. They've been part of this product development process, which is exciting to people. And they're, they're going to give you feedback instead of going on Google and just writing a shitty review about you. They're going to tell you, hey, listen, I didn't like this about the product. Can you change it? Or are you thinking about changing it? Or at least here's my feedback. So that that's something you can be primed for um, to either fix or explain rather than having someone out there blasting you on the internet. Okay. Um, when it comes down to it, once you start selling products en masse, you're going to find that there are people who are going to go and leave poor reviews on your product. Maybe they didn't like the customer service, something or other. It's a lot harder to control at that point in time. But you can really control the narrative early on, especially with your early adopters. If you treat them well and you treat them like it's um, you know, a relationship rather than you're just taking information from them and that's it. So when you talk to people, guys, broad, open-ended questions. Tell me about the last time you had this problem. So uh, for Hamza's case, tell me about the last time you went to the doctor. What were the challenges you had? That's a great way to start, right? Um, I've got a whole bunch of other questions here on this slide. What is the worst part about the problem? How do you call it currently solve the problem? Like what's your current workaround? Tell me about the last time you had it. If you're going to, this is my favorite. If you were going to create a company to solve the problem, how would your company do it? Or if I gave you a million dollars to solve the problem, what would you do? Because then people can think very creatively. They're not going to just stay in their own bubble. They're going to go outside their bubble and they're going to say, okay, I'm trying to solve this problem for a lot of people. What would I do? Right. And because they have a different relationship with the problem than you, that feedback is going to be super helpful. So there's a ton of questions, guys. I can I can send you a sample list of like questions um, based on a case. Um, if you want, I can include that in the follow up if Arib wants to send that off. But, uh, you know, this is going to be up to you and they're all going to relate back to your assumptions. Um, but you have to think creatively, right? Just don't, just don't, just don't come out and tell them what you're trying to solve. Because if people know that you're trying to, you know, hey, I'm building a thing to solve this problem I think you're having, and then you you ask that to them, they're probably gonna come back and say, like, well, maybe I have that problem, but I'm just gonna tell them that I do because it'll because I'm nice, right? I, I want I, I don't want to tell them that he's working on something that's bogus, right? Um, and, and that's a form of, of, uh, of bias, right? So again, we want to try to avoid bias at all costs. Okay. So just a little aside here, guys, um, there's a business strategy concept known as blue ocean strategy. Okay. Um, on the left here, we have the red ocean. This is where you have heavy duty competition. This is like the airline industry, right? They're beating each other into a pulp, making them all bloody. All each, all the competitors just bloodying each other up because they're, it's a race to the bottom, right? Over here, you've got the blue ocean where you're creating uncontested market space, right? Um, so on the, on the, in the red ocean, it's competing in existing market space. You're trying to beat the competition, right? Usually it's on price. So you're exploiting the existing demand in the market. 
and you're making what we call the value cost trade-off. So how do we get this in the hands of the most amount of people for the cheapest price? And yeah, you're probably gonna have to give up some of the value that you expect in order to achieve that price. But in order for us to compete, we have to make it as cheap as possible, right? So you see how that can cause a problem? Over here on the right, we have the uncontested, this is the blue ocean, the uncontested market space. We're making the competition irrelevant, right? So if you do it right, and I'm gonna give you an example in a minute here, but if you do it right, you ultimately have that space to yourself. You don't have any competitors for a while anyway. Um, so you're, you're creating and capturing new demand, okay? You're creating the demand instead on the, you know, in the red ocean, you're trying to go after existing demand and you're breaking that value cost trade-off. Um, ultimately you're in pursuit of differentiation and low cost, but differentiation, the most important thing guys, right? If we understand the customer's needs, we validate these needs, we can create a product or service that has better differentiation, that allows us to be different from the competition. What's my example? I'm sure a lot of you guys have probably heard of Cirque du Soleil, okay? This is a fantastic new age circus, we'll call it. What did they do? They, they used to be kind of the, the old version, big top, you know, elephants, trapeze artists, clowns, jugglers, that whole thing. That's what they used to be. And what did they do? They said, well, this is a really competitive market. There's circuses everywhere. We all do the same thing. So how do we stand out? And how do we take some of that market and, and, and really just lessen the competition, the pressure that the competition is putting us on? So they said, they asked their, the people that go to these events, like, what, what do you like about circus? What do you don't like about circus, right? Well, I mean, I like the acts. I mean, I like, I like seeing people do defy like defying um, physics and flying through the air and you know I really like that element but I you know when I go to see a performance I want a storyline I want some sort of uh, something to pull me in right and I want that combined with lighting amazing lighting and and music and and all of that right and so they created this current model of Cirque du Soleil that we know and love and it's 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 more performance based than it is circus so it's like circus plus right but they're they're playing in the blue ocean right right now who's their competition do they have much competition not really right so they they don't they did not compete with existing circuses because they created something else right ultimately um all they had to do was talk to their peop the people that go to these shows to figure out what was missing and they prototyped it and tried it and then they made billions of dollars so that's where we want to get you guys okay the problem interview i've got a little video i'm going to show you here this is how do we avoid bias when we're doing our interviewing you know i previously talked about you know problem interviews the type of questions you can ask this is just gonna, this little video here is gonna help you just avoid some of that bias. So I'm gonna just do this dance of going back to my uh, other screen here. Okay, the mom test, here we go. We're told, don't ask your mum if your business idea is a good one. She'll just say yes because she loves you, of course. The mum test is a set of simple rules for crafting good questions that even your mum can't lie to you about. Let's have two conversations and see what we can learn. Mum, I've got a business idea. Can I tell you about it? Of course, dear. You like your iPad, right? Do you use it a lot? Yes. Okay. So would you ever buy an app which was like a cookbook for your iPad? Hmm. And it only costs £20. That's cheaper than your hardbacks on the shelf. Well, 
and you can share recipes with your friends. And there's an iPhone app which is your shopping list. And videos of that celebrity chef you love. Yes, dear. That sounds amazing. Twenty pounds is fine. Will it have pictures of the recipes? Yes, definitely. Thanks, Mum. I'm going to quit my job and put all my savings into my new start-up. Won't you have some lasagna? That conversation led us down the garden path. The mum test is about talking to your customers about their life, not your idea. It's about discussing specifics in the past, instead of generics or opinions about the future. It's about talking less and listening more. Let's do it again right this time. Hey mum, how's the new iPad? Oh, I love it. I use it every day. What do you usually do on it? Oh, you know, read the news, play Sudoku, catch up with my friends. What's the last thing you did on it? Well, Dad and I are off on holiday. I was looking where to stay. Did you use an app for that? No, I just used Google. What app should I use? How did you find out about the other apps you have? The Sunday paper has a section on the apps of the week. Makes sense. By the way, I saw a couple of new cookbooks on the shelf. Where did those come from? Oh, they're one of those things you just end up getting at Christmas. I think Doreen gave me that one. Haven't even opened it. As if I need another lasagna recipe at my age. Hmm, time to refine my idea. We discovered many insights in that conversation to help us adjust our idea. It just goes to show. If you can get useful business information from Mum, you can get it from anyone. The Mum Test Beauty Ah Sorry. Okay. So hopefully that that's my first video on on uh, avoiding bias. I've got one more video to show you guys on avoiding bias. This one's got some a few laughs in there, but um, I think it's very important. You could talk to anybody. It's so important to um, make sure you're asking the right questions because um, you can waste a lot of time if you if you are, are doing it wrong. So um, I've got one more question, uh, one more video to show you, and then I'm going to take some questions if you guys have any. Um, I forgot this other video was there, or <laughs> I wouldn't have um, switched my screen back. One sec here. All right, here we go. Welcome to the Lyft series on customer development. Today, we're going to be talking about customer interviews, or specifically, how to do a good customer interview and the rules around that. So customer development is all about validating your assumptions around your business. And the way you do that is by talking to your customers. There's a couple simple rules that we have that will help you make sure that you're getting good information from them. The first one, and the most important, is no pitching. The difference between sales and customer development is subtle, but basically at the end, you're not asking them for money. And so if they think that you're going to be asking them for money, they're not going to be giving you the information that you want. They're not going to open up to you. So if I say, hey, I'm building this dog shampoo that makes dogs not smell bad, would you want that? That sounds like you're selling to them. So they might say no, or they might say yes, but either way, like. They're probably just saying yes because they want to be nice to you. They may not actually need it. You haven't demonstrated anything. You haven't validated any of your assumptions. So no pitching while you're doing customer development during your customer interviews. The next rule is no ice cream questions. 
A great example of an ice cream question is, do you want ice cream? No rational human being would ever say no to that question. Everyone wants ice cream, all of the time. So by asking, do you want ice cream, you're not getting anything useful out of them. So back to the dog example, uh, does your dog smell bad sometimes? Yeah, it does. Wouldn't it be great if your, if your dog didn't smell bad sometimes? Yes. What rational person would want their dog to smell bad? So you're not learning anything from that. So why bother asking? Because it ends up making you feel like you've validated one of your assumptions when you really haven't. The next one is pull, don't push. So you want to pull information out of them. You don't want to push things onto them. So uh, I might ask someone, you know, do you have a dog? Yes. Uh, cool. What do you dislike about having a dog? And they're like, oh, well, um, I mean, my dog isn't particularly well trained, so it misbehaves a lot. You're like, oh, interesting, interesting. And you, you dive into that a little bit. But you're like, you really want to see if they want this shampoo because the dog smells bad. So you're like, well, what else don't you like about having a dog? And they're like, oh, um, I mean, it really messes with my social life. Like, I have to come back every day after work and walk it and take it to the bathroom and clean up after it. And like, it's really obnoxious because I can't go out to the bar with my friends after work. And you're like, oh, interesting, interesting. Tell me about that, blah, 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 blah. And then you're like, well, what else don't you like about having a dog? And they're like, well, I mean, it sheds all the time, and I just have dog fur all over my house. And you're like, oh, interesting. They've gone through three questions. You've pulled three problems out of them, and none of them have been, my dog smells bad sometimes. So maybe that's important, right? Maybe that means that uh, their dog smelling bad isn't one of their top three problems. So in that case, you know, you learned that their dog sheds all over the place. So maybe you should think about pivoting your dog shampoo to something that makes dogs not shed anymore. Next one, N of one is not proof. So that means one person saying something shouldn't make you validate or invalidate anything. It shouldn't make you make any big decisions. If someone says something interesting and unexpected, you should go validate that and try to get 10 more people to come to the same conclusion independently. If you can't, that person was just crazy. If you can, then you've learned something really interesting. Past behavior is the best predictor of future behavior. Basically, if I say, you know, I want to go to the gym. Um, I'm going to go to the gym this year. It's my New Year's resolution. I'm going to go three times every week for the whole year. If you look back at the last three years, I've been to the gym once. Now, there's a chance that they'll change. There's a chance they'll go to the gym all the time. But what's much more likely is that they'll go to the gym once or twice that year, and then they'll just kind of stop going. So if you look back at what they have done, it's a great indication of what they will do. So a great example, another great example of this is asking someone about their diet. So let me bring my assistant up, and let's see what this looks like. This is Kev. Uh, Kev, why don't you tell me about your diet? Um, I eat uh, pretty healthy uh, yeah. all the time. Yeah. Any, any rules that you live by? Yeah, I do kind of the paleo thing, mostly various kinds of low carb, honestly. I, I sort of play by whatever rules I feel like at the time, but I try to stay away from the bread and the pasta and stuff like that. Great, great. So what we've learned is Cav eats really healthy, and uh, he stays away from breads and pastas and a lot of like meats and vegetables, right, Cav? Mm -hmm. yeah, I eat a yeah. lot of meats and vegetables, yeah. yeah great. So, so we've asked Cav about essentially his ideal self about how he sees himself and his kind of future behavior, how he plans to eat. So let's try a different question. Kev, tell me about the last meal you had. Uh, I had a sandwich uh, a couple minutes ago. Um, it, was, it was a meatball sandwich. It was pretty good. It was a lot of bread there, though, definitely. Yeah. And, and what about the meal before that? Uh, I was running kind of late to a meeting, so I had a Starbucks breakfast sandwich. Hmm. And right. what was in the breakfast sandwich? Uh, some egg. There was a lot of, there was a muffin, definitely. Muffin. They had salads there, um, but I didn't really feel like having a salad for breakfast. I felt like that was a little weird. Gotcha. Thanks, Kev. So what we discovered is, you can go now. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, wait, do you want to? Uh, what we discovered is if you ask Kev what his diet is, he'll talk about his ideal self, how he sees himself. It also um, is kind of like how he sees that he'll eat in the future. But instead, if you ask about his past self, uh, you end up finding out what he actually did. You find out of his actual self. And it turns out Kev doesn't actually eat particularly healthy. He has a lot of breads. I bet he had pasta last night or Mexican food or like all sorts of other stuff, right? So asking about their past self is asking about their actual self. And that's a great predictor of what they will do in the future. 
And so the last one is, and you just noticed this with the previous question, stories are better than statements. So Cav, how do you eat? He's like, I eat healthy. I don't eat bread. Great, those are statements. Tell me about the last time you did this. That, that encourages them to tell a story. And from that story, not only do you learn a lot more, but it gives you a lot more jumping off questions. Like, what am I gonna, how am I going to follow up, I eat healthy? Uh, what does that mean? I'm like, cool, I eat x, y, and z. That's not very interesting. That's pretty boring. So instead, you use them to tell a story. And then you can riff off that story. You can ask much more deeper questions. And they just talk a lot more. So that is the Lyft video series on the rules of customer interviews. Tune in next week for good techniques to get those stories. All right, and I was muted too, so um, perfect. Uh, I'm just going to reshare my screen. First, get my PowerPoint up and running here. Ba -ba -ba. Okay. Does anybody have any questions about what you just saw or any of the stuff we've talked about so far? Good. Okay. So just to recap some of the points that have been made. Uh, no leading questions. Uh, I know that they had a leading question in the mom test video where she said, did you use an app for that? Try to avoid that. Um, that's not helpful. Um, tell me how you did that. That's kind of a better question. Uh, search for failure points in your business, guys. If you're just fluffing yourself up, um, you know, and your business idea, that is not helpful. You're, you know, it ultimately, you're, if you're going down, as they say, the garden path, um, that's risky. You could have inevitably lose a lot of money and time doing that. You're, you know, as business owners, as future business owners, you might have a, um, or, you know, product developers, somebody's paying for this, right? So if you're just kind of going down the path and just looking at it, getting all this confirmation bias, eventually it's going to end and you're going to be left with nothing. So you have to search for failure points so that you can fix them. Open-ended questions, right? Tell me about what did you do last time? What were the challenges? Always open-ended. So watch for behavior, right? So um, if somebody's emphatic, like I've talked about before, um, they're, they're, they're ultimately something there is leading you to understand the potency of the problem, right? No pitching, um, you know, as we just learned in the Lyft video series, pitching is, is, is just ult it's ultimately going to make someone feel uncomfortable, right? I mean, how do you feel when someone comes to your door and is like, do you want to buy this, right? It doesn't feel good. Past behavior equals future behavior, right? Ask, tell me about something that happened, story, right? That's what you want. Okay, this is something that hasn't been discussed, but it's a little hint from me. Uh, and if you are applying for our Startup Survivor program, I'm going to ask you to record at least 50% of your interviews. For people that are on Teams, you guys are all, uh, from what I understand, on Teams, right? So if you're talking to people and you're making notes, and that's fun, and, you know, it's all, all is well, you're, um, you're probably missing something from what someone's telling you. I'm, I'm encouraging you to take notes, definitely take notes. But if you record, the pressure isn't so much on you taking notes, okay? So I do suggest to you though, take notes because what this allows is for the conversation to breathe, right? If I'm taking notes, like I'm, I'm uncomfortable with silence, right? So if Arib and I are chatting with each other, I'm probably going to fill the dead air with stuff, just BS that comes out of my mouth, right? That is actually important stuff because I'm probably going to tell you something that is important, right? So if you, if you can pace the conversation out by making notes, right, um, that can help you. But recording, guys, always record. You can, you know, 
get permission, right? Say to the person, hey, listen, I have a team that I'm working on to solve this problem. Can I record so that I can bring it back to my team and they can hear verbatim what you said? Um, that's what you say, okay? Um, you know, I, I, I sometimes, when we were doing streeters during my MBA, I wouldn't even be wearing, uh, or I, I, we wouldn't ask to record. I would just leave, you know, how people like let their headphones hang out of their shirt. I would just let my headphones hang out, just hit voice record on my phone. It's a little sketchy, but guess what? Ultimately, you're not posting this stuff to YouTube or posting it anywhere. It's not going anywhere, right? Either you're going to use it or it's going to get thrown in the garbage. So, you know, I wouldn't be too worried about it. It's not like it's being broadcast. Uh, I've already stressed this point, do video calls, right? I know you can't do it in person right now uh, very easily, but if you can't, always video calls. Don't talk to your friends and family. They're just bias, okay? They're just a source of bias. They probably already know what you're up to and they're probably just happy to give you whatever confirmation you need. Um, now, the final two questions you always ask, okay, what, this is a this is a common interview question. What question or questions haven't I asked you that you think I should have asked? Right. This is one that you ask when you're like in an interview, is like you know for a job, but also for customer discovery. And then the most important question you always ask is, can you introduce me to anyone that can talk about this problem? Right. You if if you don't end up if you do an interview with a reeb. And we talk to Areeb and he gives us a wealth of information and it's a great conversation. And then at the end, I forget to say, oh, Areeb, hey, listen, buddy, do you have any friends or any colleagues or anybody in your network that you could connect me to that might be able to talk about this? If I forget to ask that, guess what? The network effect ends at Areeb, right? So that branch of your network tree is trimmed off. See you later you're not gonna be able to get that back, right? That's a problem. You always need to be, you know, like let's say we're talking to a doctor, right? Hard person to get a hold of. We need to validate our idea. And so we talk to a doctor. We were lucky enough to find one to talk to. How are we gonna find more doctors to talk to? What's the best way to do it? Ask the doctor to introduce a few of his colleagues, right? Simple, all right. What are we looking for when we're doing this research? Number one, patterns, guys. You are looking for patterns. Am I hearing the same thing from five or six different, you know, how many people are telling us the same stuff, right? If we're hearing the same stuff, likely we're validating, right? We're, at, we're, we're also listening for severity or pain or potency, right? someone get emphatic when they explain something? Do they use hand gestures? Do they raise their voice? Whatever. Is there an outlier, right? So Steve Blank, I talked to you about him already. He, I have a video of him actually, I showed in, a, in another workshop I do, but he, 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 you know, at some point in the MBA that he teaches, he puts his students out there and he says, okay, go figure out what the price of this, what were, what are people going to pay for this product? And he sets the students loose with a product and their job is to figure out how much they're going to pay. People will pay. And so the students come back and Steve says, okay, let's do like a presentation. So the student gets up and he says, we talked to a hundred people. 98 people told us the price was $9.99. And so that's the price. And so Steve says, okay, but what did the other, you know, two people tell you? And the student was like, well, they're, they're major outliers. They're just, it's crazy talk what they told us. And so we just basically ignored it. And so Steve goes, okay, but what did they tell you? And the student says, well, they said they'd spend like $10,000. And he said, okay, but you two people told you they'd spend $10,000. Doesn't that seem important to you? <laughs> Doesn't it seem like you might want to figure out why, right? So if there's an outlier, make sure you're, you're trying to figure out why that person wants to, in that case, spend that much money or why they feel that way. 
because there's likely other people, while it may be a smaller minority who feel that, you know, the price for a product that normal people would pay $9.99 for would actually pay $10,000 for. But two people equals $20,000, right? So there, there could be a major value there, right? You just have to investigate it. If it doesn't make sense, ask why, okay? Okay. Does anybody have any questions? It's a very quiet bunch today. Are you guys already played out? I mean, we haven't even, it's like what, Tuesday? <laughs> Long week. Okay, the solution interview. Okay, so now we've gone through a problem. We've, we've had our, got, we, we have our assumptions. We've gone out, we've tested them and we've validated them. We've iterated on them. If, if they prove to be false, we come up with new assumptions, right? And we've done that cycle. So now we feel like we've got a pretty good grasp on the problem, right? What do we do next? Well, we get together with our team and we talk about what could be a solution, right? We have a, we do a design sprint. We, um, we throw some ideas against the whiteboard, right? And then we, we come up with either, there's two ways you can go about this. You could build a prototype, really inexpensive prototype. And I'll show you a few things um, in a coming slide here. Or you can just go out and talk to someone and say, hey, here's what we developed. You know, what do you think? And so qualitative research or inexpensive prototypes, that's the next step, okay? What do you do? How do you, how do, you do um, a solution interview? Kind of here's the step-by-step -step guide. Make people, people a pre, a pre, feel appreciated for helping you. Put the prototype in front of them or you, um, if you're not using a prototype, uh, you can ask them some questions. Uh, if you're using a prototype, ask which part of the prototype was, was most useful. What do you think some of the challenges with using this would be? How would you make it better? What was missing from it? Uh, how would you use it, right? So you can ask them all of those questions. So, so mostly it's, it, you know, if I, I recommend coming to a, a solution interview with a prototype, but you can have already pre kind of loaded some questions for them to answer as well. But it helps people get in the right mind space when you bring something as simple as a storyboard or a drawing and, and some of these other things that I'm gonna get into right now. Um, bring something with you. Okay, so uh, is this video on here? Nope, I've got another video to show you. Uh, this is a real video. Um, this is, I think, my final video, actually, so yeehaw. Um, this is a video about Dropbox, okay? This is a real video. A lot of people don't believe that this is real, but this was created by the creators of Dropbox, and um, it helped them not only get funding, but it also helped them evaluate or validate their, their problem and solution. So there you go. You've been there to buy lunch and realize your wallet is in your other pants. Or maybe you left your keys at home. The problem is organization. You need one place for everything, like a magic pocket. Putting something in the magic pocket means it's always there, no matter what you wear or where you are. The same thing is true for computers. If you have more than one, keeping track of all of your files can be a pain. Solving this problem is one of the big ideas behind Dropbox. It's like a magic pocket, a single, secure place for all of your stuff. Let's meet Josh, who is preparing for a big trip to Africa. Right now, all of his trip info is spread across his laptop, desktop, and phone. He needs to consolidate it all and is tired of having to email files to himself or move them around with a USB drive. Then he found Dropbox which creates a new kind of folder on his computers. These folders work hard to be exactly alike, even across Macs and PCs. By adding his itinerary to his laptop Dropbox, he can be sure the same file will show up in his desktop Dropbox and even on his phone. The same thing happens when he saves a document in a Dropbox folder. The document gets updated across all of his Dropboxes. But it's not just his computers. The Dropbox website also works to be exactly like his other Dropboxes. Anything he puts in Dropbox is available on the website automatically. This way, if his Jeep takes a dive, 
and his computer is ruined, he can still get to his files on the Dropbox website, where they're always backed up. As it turns out, Josh's Safari was a success, and his laptop made it home with lots of videos and photos to share. Instead of emailing everything, he just shared a Dropbox folder with his mom, so she could get copies of photos she wants to frame. Because it worked so well for travel, Josh made Dropbox the home for all of his stuff, so it's accessible anytime, wherever he goes. Whether you're traveling the world, running a business, or simply organizing your life, Dropbox means you can stop worrying about managing files and backups and get on with your next adventure. You can download Dropbox now at GetDropbox.com. Yeah, so <clears throat> that's a real video. They, I mean, think about it, right? Dropbox is incredibly complicated cloud ser cloud uh, storage uh, service. How the heck are they supposed to show off the true value in that service without creating it, right? So that what they did was they made a video, right? Here's how it works. Um, so. When we're prototyping, what are we testing? We're testing, are we moving in the right direction? Are we solving the buyer or the user's problem? Does the customer like using it? Do they think there's benefit in it? Are you maximizing your efficiency and leveraging your assets and delivering the product, right? There's a lot of things you're testing in, 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 uh, when you're, when you're you know, prototyping, but ultimately, number one, are you moving in the right direction? I wanted to share with you guys this very um, useful tool. Uh, it's really simple, but it's from Strategizer, the people that make uh, the value proposition canvas, the business model canvas. A lot of these tools that you, if you're not introduced to them right now, will likely be introduced to at some point. Um, this is a test card, right? And uh, it just helps you kind of focus on how to run some of these tests, these UX tests that you're going to be doing. So, uh, you know, kind of in order, the steps to filling one of these out, state the risks and assumptions, turn them into a hypothesis, define the results, build and launch an MVP and analyze the results. So the card, we filled it out. So this is a Dropbox test. It's filled out by a guy that works at uh, Dropbox. His name is Joe Blow. His hypothesis, we believe that respondents will see benefit in sharing files across devices. Sure, that's just that's one assumption that they have. There's a like, likely a lot more assumptions there though, right? But that's one that we're gonna write down. To, fair, to verify this, we will show respondents a video explaining how it works. Our, and what we're gonna measure, the number of respondents who said they would use this piece of our solution weekly or they would use our solution weekly. We are right if 75% of respondents answer in the affirmative, right? So, hey, this is the metric. Here's the test. And then the metric is clearly defined, right? So as a team, we know what does success mean? And can we move on to the next test? So here's some prototyping methods, guys, right? This is... This is Airbnb. We're all familiar with Airbnb. Um, actually, uh, when I did my MBA in, in down in San Francisco, we had uh, we had real clients in uh, that we did our case studies on, and um, actually, what four or five cohorts before my cohort, um, one of the clients was Airbnb, and this is what they helped them create they help them create a wireframe interface or um, a fake interface. So you can do a wireframe interface. This is more of a fake interface. Designed in, face, in Photoshop, they put it together and it didn't take very long, a lot less time than it would have taken to put together a, a website. And they take it and they show it to their end user and they say, hey, what do you think? Does this, does this make sense, right? And they can get some feedback, right? 
another method, storyboard, right? So, I mean, similar to a video, right? However, without, you know, doing some stop motion animation like the Dropbox guys did, they just put the steps to this process in, you know, six boxes and just drew them out. And they added some subtitling here to make sure that people understood, but you could just build a, a drop, uh, a storyboard of, of um, the process, put it in front of your end user and see what they say, right? It's a great way to get feedback. Um, I took this photo when we were doing um, research for a class, we were asked to design a futurist or a future retail experience for a product that is yet to exist. And the product we were assigned is Biosensor, which I know exists now and we're on the cusp of existing back in the day. But what we didn't know, we actually had to, I mean, Biosensor is very, very broad, right? So we were like, okay, so what do we, what kind of biosensor is this, right? Like, what does it do? So we thought a lot about, well, there's people are having issues with stress nowadays. So why don't we just say that this is a biosensor that tests your, you know, looks at your galvanic skin response and, you know, uh, uh, you know, other things and determines your stress level, right? So we, what we did was we rebranded an existing product. This is a Band-Aid. We put it in a really sweet container. We found this like premium looking container and we bought these really, you know, fairly cheap Band-Aids and we stuck them in this container and then we went up to people and we said, here, can we like put this on you? It's a biosensor. and We'd like to just ask you about what you think that the retail experience would be like. So we slapped this Band-Aid on people's arms and we, you know, it was interesting when we watched them they would hold their arm out like almost the entire time as they spoke about this, this band-aid, not this, this fake biosensing product. And they gave us really interesting information. You know, uh, some of them were like, well, yeah, we would expect it to be like the Apple store, except with like a clinic vibe, you know, like the people that work there would be wearing scrubs and, you know, I mean, we heard a lot of stuff, but but basically what I'm trying to tell you is we, we just rebranded an existing product, right? If you're trying to solve a problem where a product already exists, it's just not working well enough, change that product and rebrand it and use that, right? What's the point in fully reinventing the wheel? Um, other methods, right? You guys probably heard a lot about 3D printing. Over here on the left, we have the Nikon cameras. You know, there's a 3D printing lab at Mac. I know they're probably shut down right now. There's one at Mohawk College. And to be honest, they, they cost 300 bucks on Amazon. You know, get yourself a 3D printer if you're interested in making products. I really highly recommend learning that skill set. Um, you know, but if you're into something a little lower tech, use, you know, cardboard. This is like, I think a Wii or, sorry, uh, I don't know what kind of Nintendo console that is i'm out of the game but uh you know built you know they built a console out of cardboard right crafting supplies recyclables you can build things just out of just about anything and of course we have a method called the man behind the curtain i'm sure there's people sitting here going well but riley what about like what if we're building like an ai solution or we're you know it's a machine learning algorithm and that's where the intrinsic value is well what you could do is this thing called man behind the curtain right and it comes from wizard of oz where there's someone who's instead of the machine doing the work there's someone a human pulling the levers right and that's essentially this type of prototyping right and so what would happen is is all a machine learning algorithm or AI is, is it, it takes an input from the human, it processes, it does some stuff, and then it gives you an output, right? So what you do is you create this test. 
So I would go to Arib and I would say, what's the input, Arib? And he would say, you know, maybe we're testing something on like buying a house or, you know, maybe that's that's the product that I built. So I say, okay, Arib, tell me like, what are the characteristics of the house you're looking to buy and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, all this other input that you your product would eventually take. And he says, here it is. Here's all the, here's here's my feedback. And then you take that, you go out and you find him a house that's up to those specifications. Then you report back to him with the ad, the listing, and you say, here's the ad, here's the house that you want. And you see if he has, if he finds value in that, then that's what, that's the product that you build, right? So you become the computer. You do the processing work. Essentially what you're testing is, is, are we moving in the right direction? Have we built something or come up with an idea that provides value. So normally uh, I give this uh, workshop for our customer discovery, uh, sorry, for our teams entering the um, Startup Survivor. Um, so I don't really need to talk about this part unless you guys are interested, um, you know, uh, in asking me some questions, I can get into it. They're doing a little bit of customer discovery as well as part of this program, they're supposed to yeah. Five users as a team. So if you can talk about yeah. it, great. Well, yeah, I mean, this is kind of the specifications for what we're after for our startup, our, our, our startup survivor uh, competition, right? So, uh, you know, I don't really need to get into to that. Um, but you should now have enough information to go out and do customer discovery though, guys. Um, so my email's there. Um, I know you guys are tired, <laughs> so, but please, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm, you know, I've got another 20 minutes I'm, I'm available to you. So if you have questions, please, uh, you know, um, don't be afraid to ask. Who's got questions? There's gotta be, someone's gotta have a question. Nobody. Really, after all that? Hamza, you still there, brother? Yeah, I'm still here. Hey, man. Uh, do you have any questions? You, you know how to do you got you got kind of the idea with the customer discovery? Yep, well, I have a pretty good idea. And I'll discuss. I don't think my groups here today. But I will discuss it with them, with them once we meet next time. Fantastic. Well, I guess I'm good. I'm guessing they're going to share this video. And uh, I've got a present the presentation I'm going to share. I'm looking in the chat here. It looks like uh, maybe there's some Maybe there's some questions here in the chat. Uh, Reeb's saying, don't leave yet. Presentation was very clear, Ahmad. Okay, good stuff. Uh, I guess you were, is that clear that there are no questions? Oh, well, wow, 10 out of 10. Okay, all right, guys. Uh, I, I uh, Best of luck. If you have any questions for me, uh, there's my email address. And don't forget, if, you're, uh, if you, if you want to try to make some money this summer, sign up for our startup survivor program all right that's it arib thank you riley once again for joining us uh, to, yeah. and uh you know educating and informing us all on the process of customer discovery and validation it's a critical step in any uh startup or even any problem solving uh initiative whether you're working within a company or outside of a company uh finding you know customer validation and, and this entire process is actually really really important. I, uh, I wanted to share it with all of the participants in our program. Uh, this is something that the, all of the participants will benefit from, whether they're product managers or business analysts or designers, because at the end of the day, it all comes back to the customer. So uh, uh, speaking of that, I know that a lot of you guys are wondering about your deliverables and the tasks that are assigned to you on your weekly schedule. So I'd like to share a little bit about that. We sent out an email, uh, you guys should have all received it, and it contains an attachment which has your workbook. So this workbook, I will share my screen here. This workbook was actually prepared by Haltech and Silicon Halton, uh, which is an incubator, um, incubation center, national incubation center in uh, uh, Burlington and Milton. A series of workshops on this, and it's basically called the Roadmap to MVP, Minimum Viable Product. And uh, it goes through a whole process talking to you about how 
um, you can go from each stage of your uh, MVP process, defining, you can see that here, performing customer journey, defi defining features and functions and uh, data integration and uh, how to talk to an application development team uh, and, and approaching different solutions for your tech challenges, uh, such as integrating um, and hosting and cloud solutions and things like that. So for this first part, uh, just this, this will be mostly about identifying your MVP. I'm not going to go through all this whole document because it, it's very intensive. There are 97 pages, uh, but it's a very intensive document. I'd recommend you guys go through this with your team in a team meeting. Uh, and throughout the document, it will give you several case studies that will show you how to complete the tasks that were assigned to you. And then it will also provide you with a worksheet template that you can use to complete your tasks. So for example, it, it talks about Tesla, it talks about uh, Shopify, and you can see their mission and vision statements here. You guys can read that on your own time. And then it will ask you as a team to come up with your own mission and vision statement. So this is something that will be completed by the business analyst. And then as you're working through this, um, it will guide you through different, um, like how to create a customer profile. So basically what Riley talked about today, talking to customers, uh, defining customer personas and user journey maps, things like that. So it will give you a worksheet that you can then use to uh, define your user persona. Uh, and so it does that for all of the deliverables that you guys have been assigned in all of your roles. So once again, I recommend completing this um, as a team. This is a very intensive document. So it's not something that's meant to be you know, completed in one sitting. You're gonna have to come back to it, do research uh, and then come back to this and you know, solidify your ideas and things like that. So uh, that's what I wanted to tell you guys a little bit about. The other thing is that uh, this will be due on February 14th. So you guys have 12 days. Uh, so that's the Sunday right before reading week. And the reason why we've set that date is because we want you guys to use the reading week time uh, with your software developers to actually begin building uh, your solutions. Does anyone have any questions? Uh, so Shristi is asking, where can we find the workbooks? They have all been emailed out to all the members participating in this program. We will also share them on Slack in the general channel, uh, but everyone should have received uh, this email. But if not, you will find it on Slack. And so every member should have it, but you only need one submission per team. Any other questions? I actually have a question for Riley. Yeah. Um, like I had a class, so I showed up a bit late, but I was wondering if there was one thing that we should take away from, from your session, what would it be? Like, what's the main thing we, you want us to remember? I think I, I, I try to hammer on this as much as possible, but um, I want you to focus on the problem. First and foremost, I know this is super repetitive, uh, but it, it's like that for a reason, right? Focus on the problem. Um, if you jump to some solution and try to make a solution fit with a problem, it's so painful, right? So, and I think um, Sarah talked about killing your darlings. Um, you don't have to kill your darlings this way, right? Try to just focus on the problem. And also uh, another little, little tidbit, always talk to your customer. Don't, don't, do, a, don't do surveys. Okay, so focus on problem, talk to your customer or your end user. Thanks for that question. That's okay, a good thank one. you so much. It's a good one. Any other questions, guys? If there are no questions, um, last thing I wanted to say is you can submit uh, the deliverables in one document, it can, you can either annotate the workbook itself, it's a PDF, or you can make a PowerPoint presentation and put all of your points there, or you can uh, create a Word doc or a Google Slides. Um, either way is fine. Just get that to us by February 14th so that we can track your progress and see how all of the teams are doing. That's it on my end.